So hello, my name is Eric Hestenes. I'm Director of Engineering at the George Lucas Educational Foundation. A uh, little bit about me, my background is in financial services technology, um, but more recently I've been doing things in the public sector, including some open government work. Um, that led me into some work um, on things like peer to patent, which is an open government project, and some help with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And from there, that led me into some Drupal consulting. But what I really enjoy most is agile software development, which is delivering useful software. So I'm going to talk about the work at Edutopia. Edutopia is um, the foundation is a nonprofit. Um, the focus of our foundation is to shine a light on what works in education, We're primarily on K-12 education. And we have a small team. Our website is edutopia.org. And our website is a single page application. So it's got the front end is Node and React, and the back end is, um, among other things, it's um, Drupal 8 with JSON API. So a little bit about our journey. Um, and I'm going to be really talking about a case study of things we learned while working on Edutopia. In 2016, we made a decision to try to improve our platform. We launched a new rebuilt site in January 2018. We had a lot of challenges in doing so, um, but we overcame many of them and went to a few conferences related to this in this, you know, DrupalCon would be an example, and we noticed that not a lot of people had examples of the kinds of things we were doing. So my goal here is to share some of what we learned and some of the patterns which may be useful to others. So some of the challenges we faced include our initial decision to build a, what we call a decoupled system that has React and Node on the front end and Drupal on the back end. And then how to get data out of the API, um, resolving URLs, previews, media handling, and performance. So these are some of the challenges we faced and I'm gonna talk about them today. So where we started, we were in Drupal 7, and we had this choice moving into Drupal 8, which is to go with a path of PHP or Twig and Node and React. Um, and we didn't have exposure or experience with either one of those two. We had to choose a path, and every path implied doing a lot of learning. And so the real question was, if we went with going with JavaScript, what does that even mean? What does it really mean? And since this is not a widespread pattern. It's actually becoming widespread now, but at the time we couldn't see a lot of examples of it. Does it even work? So why would we, you know, for starters, why would we use Drupal as a service? For us, we already had an existing Drupal website. Um, we had lots of legacy data. We had more than 10,000 articles on our website, and we also wanted to go deeper into the front end universe. Um, those are primary reasons for us, but there's other good reasons to use Drupal as a service. One is you might not want to have a proprietary CMS. Um, you might have needs that include typical content management use cases. Um, you want to, might want to have a baseline that can evolve over a longer period of time. Um, and then for us, going to the front end universe, we really wanted to tap into the community and the ecosystem there and take advantage of things that are not in Drupal. So. One question is, is using Drupal this way supported? Um, yes, it is. Um, in the Drupal community, support has been building up over time. Uh, they have an initiative in the community called the API First Initiative. Um, they have integration for JSON API and GraphQL that's readily available at this time. And you combine that with their solid baseline of content management capabilities, um, and they have a wonderful community. Um, there's also on-ramp, so an example would be Contenta. Um, there's also things related to Gatsby. Um, so the supports for using Drupal as an API have been building up over the last 24 months. So the next issue is how to get data out of the back end. And at the time, we had to choose between JSON API and GraphQL. Um, and this is in 2016. GraphQL wasn't quite there at that time. It is there now. Um, but we chose JSON API. In our approach with JSON API, JSON API, when you use it with Drupal, is verbose. There's lots of data that gets returned by it, which is all the metadata associated with your content. And so the way we use it is we use sparse field sets, which is typical JSON API. Um, but we also um, compress the API responses, and we proxy them using Fastly. Um, we're using PM2 clustering in order to 
um, avoid having blocking threads on the API. And we needed something that we call a resolver. So what's that? So because we have a legacy database of content, uh, the URL patterns were not strict and they evolved over time. And in front end, like in a React app, they are very strict in interpreting URL patterns and routes. So we need a solution for that. So historically, we have a lot of content that falls into the URL, URL route slash blog. And now our new pattern for the latest content we do is slash article. But we needed to handle the old routes. We didn't want to change the URLs for thousands of articles. And so it's important to think of in the R context, the routes are content. They're not just a hard-baked part of the application. So from a front-end perspective, the front-end, when, when the router sees the URL, it doesn't know which endpoint to hit. Um, it also doesn't know what to return from that endpoint. So we needed a solution. And so the way we resolve URLs is that we created a custom endpoint that has a parameter, which we call a URL slug. And it determines the proper React component type based on the URL. And so it, in that resolver, it may remap some of the older URL patterns to, to return the correct component in the front end. And so we then we use JSON API to serialize the object. Um, and this allows us to, over time, have changes to the URL patterns and have the application be completely happy and sort of agnostic to what those patterns are. Um, so we take the URL, we resolve it through Drupal. Another big challenge was previews. And so um, in a content editing standpoint, um, editors want to be able to see as they're editing it what the thing will look like. And if you have a separate front end from the back end, that means the Drupal system has way, no way to know what, no way to render the front end properly. And also, um, when you're editing, you're working on revisions, actually, not live software. And JSON API doesn't directly support revisions. So we needed a way to get a specific revision and then configure the front end to use that revision. Um, so the first thing we did, this is a, a typical um, kind of vanilla Drupal edit form. And we implemented a module called Workflows that lets you assure that when you are creating a draft, the draft gets saved. And then in the edit back end, there's a link here that says previews, pre, uh, view preview of this um, revision. And what that does is that link contains a revision identifier that tells the front end what to use. When the user clicks that, they're taken to a, a preview, which is an exact instance of our, our Node React app. Um, but it's in a special doc root, which is a special installation. Um, so um, the revision is baked into the editor link. Um, we have a separate doc root for the preview. And we used exactly the same engine to render the preview as we render the front end. Um, and in the Drupal world, we're doing something where we override a normalizer and we make a little change to the way JSON API works so that the revision ID is returned. So we had to do some customization. That's with the current version of JC JSON API. There's a new version of JSON API for Drupal that's coming out that has baked in support for revisions. So doing this will be easier. Um, and we have a GitHub example if anyone's interested. So the next challenge that we had was we needed to have ability to build flexible landing pages. So our, our site um, is like a media site. Um, even though we focus on education, on the inside we're more media. And we need an ability to build landing pages and to, to allow editors to build complex pages and to be able to deploy those pages with no code, no front end deployment. We also wanted the complexity of those pages out of the front end. So these are some examples. Um, examples of layouts that we handle are like a list view. We have a, um, a small grid and a big grid, and we have what we call a lead that has a lead article. And these are just some examples. So the way the experience works for an editor, um, and um, let me actually show this. So this is um, the edit page for our landing page. Let's, let me go to, let's see. So this is our home page. This is the landing page for topics. And you'll see things in different layouts here. So this is what the back end of that looks like. It's really a set of components. And each component, we call them a query component because the data for the component is pulled dynamically. So I can go in and edit a component. I can change the heading. I can define criteria for how it's, um, um, for what is pulled and displayed. And then I can define pagination if I wish. 
And then there's also a type of component, so I can have things in a small grid or a large grid or a list feature. Um, and so in this way, we have a, a flexible way to um, handle the layouts. Um, so the next challenge for us was media. So we had an existing library of images that are used on our website. And we have what we call a master image. The master image is a source image that's used. And we had a requirement that we be able to automatically generate crops for that. And we do things like um, set focal points on the image. So when it crops, um, the focal point is proper based on the particular crop that's used. So what we needed, though, in the environment where you have a front end that's separate from the back end, we needed a way to generate the responsive images and then to use those images in our content. So the way we're ha handling that is we're um, taking advantage of a, an approach that you can use on AWS called a serverless image handler. Um, the CloudFront CDN, we, we take the master image, we push it onto the S3, CloudFront CDN redirects to Lambda if there's no derivative found, which is the image that you need for a particular responsive layout, then it generates it on the fly and stores it in S3. And so we use Drupal to manage the responsive image breakpoints, if you will, but the, all the media itself is it's separated out in its own microservice sitting over in S3. So for us, I think the key question is, what's the upside of decoupling? Um, and decoupling is you know, separating the front and the back end. We wanted a cleaner and better separation of concerns. We wanted a higher degree of control over the front end of the middle tier. We wanted to tap into the Node and JavaScript community. It's a wonderful community and powerful. Um, we also have noticed that since we separated these two elements, the velocity of our changes is much higher in the front end side of the universe than the back end. And that's what we would have expected. That's kind of why we went in this direction. Um, but it also means that the backend services are much more stable. The scope of what's in the Drupal service is much more limited, and it serves a very particular function, which is a content service. Um, and so that's a smaller footprint, which means that we actually spend relatively less time focusing on the backend experience and developing services, and most of our time is spent on the front end. Um, and because of the separation, we can do smart things like um, remember what's happening in the session and be smart about network activity and how we handle network traffic. So some examples of that, we have spent quite a bit of time doing t tuning of Edutopia. Um, and we started out with, before we even started any work or even before we picked our approach, we had a performance budget. And the performance budget was four seconds page load on mobile 3G with a stretch goal to hit sub-second. Um, and Adi Osmani posted a post two days ago about this same concept, if you want to read more about performance budgeting. Um, what performance budgeting is valuable for is when you get a new request that um, adds to your performance or detracts from your performance, it gives you a way to kind of say, you know what, we have to weigh that request and not automatically give in to every request that you get. But some of the things in performance tuning that were really important to us was or were pay attention to bundle size, limit the trips, the round trips to the network. Um, we use code splitting to load just the code we need. Um, we use CSS and JS, and part of our journey was we started out with something that's more pure SAS, then we used Aphrodite, and we wound up using Emotion. We wound up using Emotion because it played most nicely with the code splitting. Um, and then we also leverage progressive web, web apps, and so we use a service worker, we, use, we follow the Lighthouse checklist, um, and so performance has been a key tiebreaker for many of the decisions as we pr move forward in our development. So other things that we have worked on to create perception of speed is that we store the results of API calls in state. We do prefetching of API calls under some circumstances. We do lazy loading of images and content. We do fetching of image. When you hover over an image on desktop, it'll fetch the content behind it um, if you hover over a link. Um, and then also, we spend a lot of time just doing relentless monitoring using web page test and Lighthouse, dev tools, and page speed insights. And it's kind of ironic, even though we had that um, four second page load budget, even during the project, the metrics that they use for page measurement have changed now to first content full paint and so forth. So even though 
we set a goal. Um, the target moved even in the middle of the work, um, but we were in a good place. Um, so some of the gotchas that we experienced are um, service workers. So we use Workbox, and I noticed about, I don't know, a week or two, they added Workbox into the Create React, React app 2, version 2. Um, and our experience has been that Workbox saves a lot of time, and it, it helps you with building a performant application because it has um, well-defined patterns for things like caching content. Um, and other things we observed is that if you make our app too smart on the client side, then you could have an uh, unexpected negative impact to your SEO. And so handling server-side rendering is really important. Um, Um, it's really important to make sure that the bits that you want Google to find are found. Um, and uh, we also implemented Google AMP. And in our environment, Google AMP implies um, a whole second node application because it's so dissimilar from what we do in our standard application that we needed a whole separate application. And we also have been bit by web font performance, which is a fairly common thing. Um, so, but for us, one of our biggest fears has been um, the, the iceberg of learning um, a whole new set of frameworks. There's so many things to learn. We have a very small team. We have to know Express, React Router, Redux, Webpack, um, and not only that, but all the Drupal side things, not only that, but Amazon things. Um, we also have a new tool chains. Um, so, Coming up to speed on these things has taken a lot of time, um, and it, it required us to get experienced help on our team as well. Um, so we also have been leaning hard into very well-established patterns. Um, so this picture gives an example of where we are today. So I'm going to go from right to left. So at the bottom corner, you have Drupal with JSON API. And above that, you have what we would describe as our media service, which is really CloudFront with Lambda and S3. And then moving towards the middle, we have three instances of the front end application, or it includes actually services. It's got Node React and Redux. One is what we call production. The second is an instance for preview. And the third is an instance for AMP. Um, if you didn't use AMP, obviously, you don't need that third instance. And then we have um, Fastly wrapped around the services. So when I hit the API, I'm actually hitting Fastly, except the first time around. And then um, we have the browser. And the browser is a progressive web app. Um, it's got an app shell in it. It's got React and Redux. And we're doing a lot of things with caching and data. Um, so, um, so what are some of the things to expect from a decoupled Drupal. You expect to have a workable JSON API service. You expect to have solid, predictable, and fast API performance. Um, it needs to fit into the tool chains on the Drupal side. The tool chains is Composer, um, which it does fit into. Um, you need some way to handle a preview system. And the, the support from the community for those things is pretty solid. As we go down here, down the list, the support isn't quite as good. Um, so the preview support, as I mentioned, that's going to show up in an upcoming release of JSON API 2.0. Um, the resolver is something that you have to uh, work a little harder on to develop. Um, and then there's plenty of vendor support for spinning up and hosting Drupal these days. Um, but what they do need is better support for onboarding J JavaScript developers. Um, so I'm just going to uh, give a few more examples. So this is our, uh, one of our articles. This, uh, this is actually one of our more complicated articles in terms of the content. So when I look at this um, URL, this is an actual URL that's hitting our API. So we have a URL slug. And this is a slug which defines the content. So when I hit this, it's going to the back end. It's um, first checking Fastly. If it's nothing in Fastly, then it goes all the way through. And it looks at the URL route. It determines based on the route what the uh, type of object it is that should be returned. And then it actually returns the appropriate object. 
it's all in a f like 30 milliseconds or less. Um, so the resolver basically lets us keep the uh, routing system managed in the CMS. Um, now we do have routes that are not in the CMS as well. Um, so, um, but we find that for the bulk of content that we have the capability to take advantage of some of the CMS features for handling redirects and URL patterns and URL aliases and so forth. Um, so looking at the landing page again, So an example of a change I can make is I can go in here and I'll just reorder the list and I'm going to edit this one and change the label and put Eric was here, save that. Uh, something's changed. Well, let's try it again. Let's just try reordering it. So I just went and reordered the list on here. Um, so this is an example of a piece of content. I'm going to go in and put text here. Eric was here again. I'm going to save that. Now there's a link that says give me a preview of the system. And so that's an example of the loop that editors go in where they can make changes and very instantly see the response. The response is all handled in the front end, but they do all the editing in the back end. Um, let's see what else we had here. Um, and then lastly, um, the experience is quite snappy, and um, the way we get to that snappy experience is by being smart about how we manage state. So when I hit the page the first time, it might be a little slower, but if I hit them again, they're always in state, and so. Moving across the pages, don't go to the network. It's very fast and snappy. Um, and um, the perception of speed is that it's very, very fast, even though from the page load standpoint, it might be typical or average. By having, um, using the power of Redux to manage a state, we can create the perception or illusion of speed. Um, and we also doing lazy loading of images um, as, as I scroll it down, it lazy loaded this whole section, which is related content. Um, and there it is. So. Okay, so. So, kind of what's a key message here? A key message is that yes, you can leverage Node and React. When I describe how we're improving performance, I'm really describing how anyone building a Node or React app would be tuning their performance. It's not special to us. We can take advantage of the Node and React environment and just use Drupal as a service, as a straightforward service. JSON API works, it's fast. You have to fit that into the appropriate architecture, like using caching properly, um, but it works. And the implementation of JSON API is changing. It's a little bit in flux. Um, so with each minor release, we're watching it closely, but it's, they're gonna move that into the core of Drupal very soon. Um, and then there's GraphQL as well, so for those who want to use GraphQL, it's out there available. Um, from the perspective of someone using the CMS, this is just opening Pandora's box. There are so many things that you can do that in the past um, would be hands off or hard to get to. And so you can take full advantage of whatever the front end environment is that you want to, to have. Um, and then Drupal, decoupled Drupal is a scaled down Drupal. So it means that, you know, compared to where we were in the past, we have many, many fewer modules. The complexity of it is simpler. There's less of a dependency on what one would describe as contributed features. Um, and so in this case, less is more and less is good. So that's pretty much it. So thank you, everyone.